Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Del Barrett. I'm the Vice President of the Royal Photographic Society. And um, the, the nicest task I've had to do this year is to choose our speaker um, for tonight's talk. And one of the great things about being Vice President is you have a choice of anybody. And I chose one of my heroes, Susan Lipper, um, because I'd always wanted to meet her. <laughs> but not only that, um, I just find her work so interesting. And um, it, it has so many different messages. And as she's got a new book out um, uh, uh, sort of the last few weeks, it just seemed very timely and very appropriate. So I'm absolutely thrilled to bits to introduce you to Susan Lipper. Well, well, thank you, Dell, and thank you, RPS, for bringing me over. And it's great to see everyone here, and thank you all for coming. And I'm actually going to read this because my memory is shit. <laughs> that doesn't mean you can't interrupt me, shout out, ask anything. It's just, it's, I'm going to stay on track more if I read it. So um, this is a portrait of William Butler Yeats, who was an Irish poet. Is this too loud or it's OK? Or, OK who was an Irish poet and bookmaker, meaning that he very consciously edited his individual poems into volumes. Many of his practices and beliefs still inform my work. My background before my concentration in, in photography was in English literature. Academic pursuits were in the English Romantic poets, American transcendentalists like Emerson and Thoreau, and W.B. Yeats in particular. I also studied the literature of voyaging, language and the mind, visual anthropology, film noir, and gangster films, which are all good things, good stuff. By default, I am a New Yorker. I was born in Manhattan, and so were my parents. And as part of my inherited baggage, we all have inherited baggage, it goes without saying that the rest of America was always a mystery to me. This is a photograph of the artist Penelope Slinger and the poet George Macbeth taken in her studio on Duke Street in 1974 when I first lived in London. I have spent many of my formative years here in this country. My work since 1980 has been assembled in series and sequences. Often it exists in book format and has a relationship to words. In general, I use traditional black and white materials and I'm drawn to the anti-tech and anti-aesthetic. Mostly I play around with the documentary tra tradition, both within and against it, while, while recognizing documentary as a constructed mode of rep representation. In addition, my work often takes the literary form of subjective travel documents and diaries. Its constant vantage point stemming from a liberal female artist from New York, who is also my photographic persona. There are echoes of literary influ influences, i.e. a quest for Eden, a preference for the simple age, pastoral vision versus urban degeneracy, and a strong dislike of mercantile values. After receiving my graduate degree from Yale in 1983, I left for London to follow my interest in the photographer Bill Brandt, also to make collaborative environmental portraits of the literary community, which at the time was somewhat of an enclosed incestuous group. After a few years, my time here was inevitably cut short by my alien immigration, immigration status. So in 1987, when I returned to the United States, it was with, with, with a renewed sense of ownership. Most likely, it was an appreciation for Walker Evans that led me to want to photograph the American South. After a short period of exploring the entire country, and also due to a series of chance events, I eventually began living 
near Mc, uh, Grapevine Branch in McDowell County in West Virginia. An unanticipated book published by Dowie Lewis when he was at Corner House was created in three months to coincide with an exhibition of 14 images that was to be held at the Photographer's Gallery in 1994. I was unaware at the time that this work 30 years ago would be the start of my adopted persona's travels from east to the west in America and my resulting trilogy. I was also unaware that Grapevine would represent for me the Eden from which we were expelled. In 2016, the original Grapevine exhibition was revisited at Higher Pictures Gallery in New York. This is from an art form review. The images dare us to take them at face value, confirming both our fears of and feelings of superiority towards white, job-starved rural communities. But they are not documentary, and Lipper has explicitly acknowledged a contract between her camera and the men before it, giving her subjects license to actively and self-consciously shape their own representations. She shot with a flash and a Hasselblad whose medium format could not be concealed, and then reviewed the prints with the sitters, allowing them to refine their poses. And then this is from the New York Times. Dare we judge the people who laid themselves bare before her camera lens, or are we even seeing the truth? Miss Lipper created these images at a moment when photography was being questioned as a purveyor of truth. The subjects here might be caricaturing their own stereotypes, which have often been accepted without challenge in the art world. Think of Katie Nolan's sculptures with empty Budweiser cans. But if art exists to ask uncomfortable questions, Miss Lipper's photographs, though taken in a different era, accomplish this task. Finally, Art Forum Online. Lipper and her subjects are staging the relations between lived reality and its rep representation. We are invited not so much to look at these photographs as through them, at the social significance of the forlorn rituals they recount. So if I don't get a laugh from this next one, um, this is a surprisingly well-preserved fax. No laughs? Okay of the original press release from the Photographer's Gallery, which saw the work as being only an example of classic documentary, despite my lame protestations that the work was performative and collaborative. This document set off a chain reaction of confusion that, um, thankfully, has been, uh, that thankfully has been addressed or overturned with time and increased photographic literacy on both sides of the Atlantic. The Grapevine series consisted of collaborative and posed portraits of friends and adopted family. Uh, one of them even wished me well today and sent me a text message. But, though some viewers have had a hard time imagining any overt social or emotional connection between myself and the inhabitants of Grapevine, this is something for which I can't be held responsible. Actually, there were numerous attractions. Equally, I was drawn to try to understand the exaggerated male-female polarities that most likely reminded me of my own background. Simultaneously, I believed my subjects enjoyed controlling the manner in which they were represented, proving to their community that they were privy to the persistent, grossly distorted stereotype that existed from before the Civil War, and that they were also photographically literate to a great degree. So I was emotionally drawn to take this image that by my subjective interpretation spoke of a central battle between male versus female. The aim of my series was never redneck exploitation or some kind of socio-political treatise. Rather, here I envisioned Peter Pan or some kind of male warrior in training. This is from the night they got married. 
You should know the Marine uniform and the fake Remington statue, and importantly for this series, it is a depiction of a middle-class home. My initial decision for over-large black borders on the print was an intentional parodying of earlier objective documentary styles, as well as the work of Diane Arbus. Deanne. Certainly my strong identif identification with defying the system is much of what grapevine means to me. I intentionally used repeat, uh, re repeating characters as in Larry Clark's Tulsa and Nan Golden's Ballad. Two things seem to be operating simultaneously in this portrait. One is my subjects reenacting a negative stereotype to improve on it versus my subjective questioning of this display of macho. We should note his fashionable use of shoelace come weapons carrier, and the words on his hat never claimed to be perfect, just damn good. The wall sign also reads, home sweet home. This was probably influenced by my love of film noir and gangster films. Also, the fishermen's caps have always reminded me of precise Parisian hoods at night. Obviously, these are not surreptitious snaps. My sitters are also giving a sort of visual testament to the fact that they were in on the deal and not some hapless victims. I uh, recently took both these images from one of their Facebook pages. And um, he's written down, it's, I think it might be hard to see it, do I look like the outlaw I'm called, LOL. But you know, clearly he's paid some other you know, photographer to take that picture of him, which is you know, pretty much all of their understandings of, of uh, you know, uh, their representation. Um, noir films tend to pose moral quandaries that are unusually ambiguous and relative to highlighting the dark sides within ourselves. Equally, they celebrate the autonomous anti-hero, as I do. And this is the last picture in the book. I read it as a draw in the contest and an, ex and an exhibit of the collaboration between subject and photographer. Feminists also envision a triumph. This is a triumph of the female gaze. Trip, the second installment of my subjective and subversive US travel trilogy, takes place further west along Interstate 10 between Mississippi, Louisiana, and Texas, but mostly Louisiana. Many people unfamiliar with the United States geography think this series was also taken in the South, but in fact, it's 900 miles away. At the time, I was well aware of the popular archetype of the male road trip and it being a voyage of discovery, personifying the dreams of finding oneself by finding America, easy rider on the road, not to mention the well-defined American documentary canon for photography. However, I wanted to challenge that treasured myth of freedom of the open road. It was not new, not glamorous, not virgin, not male. I also wanted to investigate the archetype of voyaging as portrayed in both literary and photographic tradi traditions. Uh, this is a very recent installation of Trip at Higher Pictures Gallery in New York. And in fact, this just, just closed last week after being extended. Eventually, after five years, my project, took, uh, my project along Interstate 10 assumed the quality of not being real, not set in time or location, a synthetic road trip. That's my car on the right. Perhaps now we are reminded of the television series True Detective, which is set during the same time period. My contemporary references were more like Twin Peaks or the Twilight Zone. My solitary tourism and adopted outsider status became a kind of literary mask of the same sort W.B. Yeats had used. His many personas ranged from a deranged old woman to sedate politicians. 
My persona was that of an astute female art photographer and traveler on a road trip throughout America, seeking perhaps utopia, or at least to promote her subjective, subversive female vision. Mostly, though, during this time, I was able to stay with friends, so I-10 became a very well-traveled route. However, when I looked for places that resonated, resonated within my internal archive of remembered photographic past, or reflected the country's historical memory, they weren't there. I looked in vain for places that were personal, specific, eccentric, basically not the global marketplace. What stood out to me instead were words and their unaccustomed misuse, the inadequacy of language, how road signs had become either obsolete, missing, inconsequential, or locally encoded. Words in a deeper cultural sense had no meaning. The onward journey began to resemble Joseph Conrad's heart of darkness in many ways. So this reads, laugh at your own risk. In one case, it's a simple mis spelling mistake for launch. In another, our eyes read a G instead of a C because of a misplaced nail head. The sign here is meant to say, no trespassing, but it reads, Jew house, keep out. My naive belief of America as one single country able to communicate with itself had to be altered. As such, Tripp questioned the archaeology of American culture, the glue that held the culture, the glue that held their culture together. So here we have sporadically numbered beauty, beauty queens. and the men in charge. And here I used soap. My aim was like Walker Evans to photograph the present as, as it would one day be viewed as the past and the future. That is to take a gamble that communities of readership will be on my side in the future. I mean, take, for instance, cars, how they become more interesting with age. So this is the Lakeview Motel. And this is more of the Lakeview Motel. The experienced time of trip is slow compared to Kerouac's on the road, his aim being to cram as many physical and spiritual highs into as short a journey as possible. Trip has a slow pacing, more like the work of film directors Jim Jarmusch and, and Wim Wenders. In it, time is both linear and cyclical. Also, it is consistent with the literature of voyaging that on excursions, polarity exists between the urge to explore as well as the urge, a, urge to return home. So this is staged. Most of the photographs in trips stra straddle the staged and found traditions. It was also a comment on global consumer consumerism and literacy. And this has always reminded me of the TV series, The Prisoner. A reference to Paul Strand's photograph, The White Fence, which was taken in 1916. Throughout my practice, I've always riffed on earlier practitioners' work or quoted from our collective unconscious archive of images and feel it is my responsibility to do so. And this is a shrine of post-it note prayers. And I just found out, a little bit of research, just found out that these are actually the same billboards from Texas that inspired the movie, the horrible movie actually, three billboards outside Ebbing, Missouri. This is the last picture in the book. 
a look at the phone shows you can't dial out. You must go through a possibly non-existent hotel operator. Returning home may not be possible. The voyage may not be completed. As such, the question of discovering America and discovering yourself is in doubt, as that would have required closure. In 2012, I began work in the California desert. With this body of work, I envisioned completion of my persona's journey from the forested Appalachian frontiers with a stint across Interstate 10 to sparse desert and running parallel to the westward expansion of the United States, moving from the east, being Eden-like, Eden and the past, to the west, portraying the wilderness, but also possibly the future. My persona now, almost 15 years older, is in search of restoration and greater autonomous freedom and transparency on American soil. The road west was always believed to be a safety valve for the restless American populace. Although here, maybe it is an end point or place of last resort. I completed photographing in California a few months before Trump's election. However, the book was assembled in the months that followed. You're probably going to hear that from a lot of people making work over this period. Included in domesticated land are texts and photographs which are independent of each other and amongst themselves. The meaning is meant to zigzag, to be ordered in the mind of the reader. It is interesting presenting this body of work within the UK. The past few years have been difficult ones for both our countries, though perhaps there have been parallel developments. Although I think for the present, we've been forced to look inward at our own rapidly changing local environments. For example, in the US after the election, it was hard not to be aware of the increasing tensions between the state of California and the federal government. Here, for instance, with a familiar sounding name is a comic book which charts an envisioned war not unlike the TV series Walking Dead, depicting various combating military bases. Another civil war in the United States, something I actually thought unimaginable, but now not so. The title Domesticated Land is significant. It makes reference both to the arduous property to the desert, the fact that the individual triumph triumphing over it is folly, and to the forgotten female pioneers who, like their male counterparts, sought transformation in the new lands. But instead of claiming or conquering them, they wanted to learn how they could live there. Annette Kolodny remarks in her esteemed scholarly text surveying women's writing, the land before her, women claimed the frontiers as a potential sanctuary for an idealized domestic city. Massive exploitation and alteration of the continent do, do not seem to be part of women's fantasies. Furthermore, as a female landscape photographer, it'd be hard not to pick up the gauntlet thrown down by Deborah Bright, who suggested in her 1985 essay of Mother Nature and Marlboro Men, that women might also recoup landscape photography for themselves in response to its longtime character as an exclusive white male preserve. The image of the lone white male photographer like his prototypes, the great white hunter and explorer who ventures into the wild to explore a virgin nature indoors. This coupled with the research of Gillian Rose, which reveals that the academic discipline of geography has historically been dominated by men. Women have been and continue to be marginalized as producers of geographical knowledge. Rose claims that geography is masculinist, while claiming to be exhaustive forgets about women's existence and concerns itself only with the position of men. What at this point in time would be different or telling in my persona's version? I certainly acknowledge debts to Dorothea Lange, Timothy O'Sullivan, Lee Friedlanders, the FSA, Edward Weston, and the other new topographic photographers who gave me my first mental images of the desert.
Uh, this is just an aside. That cross at the top means there's water below, but that's something that people might not necessarily know. So this is Zabriskie Point, which is the locus of the finale to Antione, Antonioni's film depict, depicting the destruction of a lot of consumerist wealth. It's also reputedly where F Foucault first took acid. I do my research. <laughs> um, the desert is a cluster of contradictory metaphors, myths, and images, and as a screen for contradictory human projections. These are food cans. So the military is intertwined economically both as part of the corporate military industrial complex and as the largest local employer. And this could happen, or not. So this is a lyric, which I'll read. I probably should have come and played this, but anyway. Drink cold duck on Tuesday. Life goals are rarely realized on Tuesday. You could end up speeding across Indiana in the back of a Toyota truck on Tuesday. Other days are meant for decisions. Other days are meant for epiphanies, but not on Tuesday. Drinking cold duck and shot glasses will make it last much longer. We'll, we'll watch black and white movies with English subtitles, and we'll finish the bottle on Tuesday. No day for eternal questions. We'll find no answers today. No one knows the meaning of life anyway on Tuesday. Drink cold duck on Tuesday. Life goals are rarely realized on Tuesday. That's from the Sibleys. And this is the epilogue. And the final quotation, which is from a, 1980, a 1949 manuscript diary. Um, by Catherine Hahn, and it was called A Women's, Tr Women's Trip Across the Plains. And it reads, after dinner that night, it was proposed that we celebrate the day, and we all heartily joined in. America West was the goddess of liberty. Charles Wheeler was orator, and Ralph Cushing acted as a member of ceremonies, master of ceremonies. We sang pa patriotic songs, repeated what little we could of the Declaration of Independence, fired off a gun or two, and gave three cheers for the United States and California territory in particular. And then finally, my persona, my persona continues her search. I don't know if it can be accommodated now, but there is theoretically a signing at the Mac booth, which they say starts at 7, but if you guys, I'll, I'll go there now. I mean, who knows? But if you want to come along, it's, uh, it's P1. Um, oh, I forgot to ask. Uh, if you pass a microphone around, if anybody has any questions, I'm happy to say whatever answer there would be to that, to those. Thanks, Susan. How, how did you get to make friends with people at the Grape Vine or Vine, uh, Grapeville 
town, I think. And uh, how did you manage to make a living throughout the journeys uh, in terms of uh, uh, having money to buy food and accommodation and all, all of that throughout your journeys? I, um, I recently got a Guggenheim grant, but obviously that was 20 years later. So it was self-funded. They liked me. <laughs> hmm? Do you know why? Um, yeah, I, I participated. I, I mean, I was, they, I stayed with a family. I, you know, I got to know them. That happened almost instant, instantaneously. I was sleeping in the back of my car, and a woman came over and said, it looks like you need a place to stay. But you see, I generally don't like to give anecdotal information. A long time ago, I did. But now you have to buy me booze. <laughs> Hi. Uh, can you talk a little bit about how, when you're doing one of these projects, that the interplay between what might have been planned at the beginning and how the, the final piece emerged and any, um, any sort of approach you had to, to making it emerge? Um, I think the shooting is just an attraction, a vague attraction to something, and you just keep shooting. And then you're also reading and researching at the same time. And then it's, it, it, I don't know, maybe it's like sculpture. You're like working with a block, and it slowly starts to take shape. So that's how I could finish shooting this before the election and create the shape after the election. I mean, if that makes sense. I mean, it was, a lot of it was the same, but it, it went through changes. So you know, as long as you feel like shooting, you keep going. I mean, that's how I do it. I take a very long time. It's not cost effective. Um, you talked about how you took influence from W.B. Yeats's way that he was putting his poems together in volumes. Yeah. Can you talk about uh, what his approach was and how you took influence from that? Um, it was a long time ago since I studied him, and I was told that was nothing. There was no difference between a Yeats scholar and a schizophrenic. So. <laughs> I, I can't really tell you which volumes, which poems were saved for which volumes, and how he would, you know, write the write, like almost like a photographer, write, shoot lots of things, throw them in different shoe boxes, and then assemble them later. Hi, Susan. Um, I had a similar question to the one that was asked about uh, specifically about the research and how it works with your photographing, like if you'll, and how you know when the research is sort of leading you astray versus leading you back into the project. You don't know. You don't know. I mean, one, one day it just clicks. I mean, you have to, you have to, op well, uh, my, my re uh, way of working is I just pick up every rock, you know. Hi there. What do you shoot on? What format? Cameras? Film? Um, I went from a Hasselblad to uh, everybody's favorite, the Mamiya 7-2. Film. Okay. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. I mean... I'm sorry, the search for what? For Eden, for the oh. Um, if you have a rent stabilized apartment, you don't give it up. <laughs> Hi. Um, do you know where the third notch in your rebate border on the Hasselblad came from? I'm sorry. Do you know where the third notch in the rebate border on your Hasselblad came from? I noticed there was a third one. Was it damaged? The third, I'm sorry. 
you know, the, the, the V's in the rebate border of a Hasselblad? <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> on, I... the left, <laughs> on the left hand side of a Hasselblad, there's two V's. Yeah. Uh, and there, I noticed there was a third one in your uh, photograph. Oh, yeah, well, I used to, that's, you close looking, you, you notch out the back so you can tell which magazine is which film. So if you're starting to have trouble with one of the magazines, you, it, is that what you meant? Okay. It's been a long time since I've had to ask, answer a technical question. <laughs> um, you talked about uh, these books being a trilogy, so I'm wondering what's next, if there is anything. Uh, what do you call four books? <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm, not, I'm not sure. I mean, I actually wouldn't mind doing the northern part of the States, but I'm, I'm happy right now for this, you know. Ward. Hey. Hi. you seem to be traveling and shooting by yourself, not with an assistant or a team or whatever, and the psychological space um, seems very solitary. You're far away from the subject, sort of lonely places. Um, but there's also all these like rich references, like the, just to like photo history. I guess I'd, I'm interested in like how community and like sharing the work with other people after the shooting is done is part of your process or not. And, that comes together. Yeah, I'll, I'll share this with you all because why not have continue to have a discussion about it. There's some tiny people, if, if you get a look at my book, there's some tiny people and they're the ones that wrote the lyrics. Um, and so they were also the people I was staying with. So there's, tiny, there's, a tiny fam there's a tiny family that's depicted inside. Um, so no, you're never, you're never totally alone, you know. Um, and my preferred audience is to is to bring this back, bring this back to the desert, show this to people. And I was very happy, not happy. I mean, they cried. Some of them cried that I really got it, you know. So it's a different different emotional reaction. Um, but uh, you know, equally, you know, you do it to just throw it out there and and see what people will make of it over time. So. I don't know if that answered your question. Uh, I thought of vacation. Um, you know, you start reading, you start reading, and then you think I have to get on the road again, or maybe I'm just going to stay in New York and think about how I really don't like, you know, whatever, whatever starts to eat away at you, um, you know. So, I mean, right now, there was a, a bunch of other, other uh, projects I've done, but I, I was worried about running over time, so I cut them out, but I'm reworking some of the older series and going back into uh, a series of portraits I did of Yale students, so, yeah. Richard. Didn't really get that is sort of still in the in the shoebox. Um, did this come out of that at all? In that those were test sites in the desert. Was there a relationship to that? To the at least as a part of the inspiration that moved you into this. Um, my reasons to go to California was not originally about um, warfare or the military. I really wasn't paying any attention to the military until I got there. Oh. Um, I don't, th I, I wasn't out there, surrounded, surrounded by it, so no, that was different.
I'm just curious if spending time with that particular community, Grapevine, gave you any insight into why Trump was elected. Interesting. Um, it's been very common to project whatever vote we're unhappy with on the state of West Virginia. <laughs> and I mean, it really couldn't be further from the truth. I mean, uh, so you have to think about why you thought that was true. I mean, my friends didn't vote. And they were, you know, Hillary people. And, uh, you know, maybe it's possible that he spoke to the coal mines or implied that he was going to be able to make them uh, more affluent and they wanted to vote, you know, with their union or, or whatever. But I have uh, clips from when, you know, uh, people took pictures of West Virginia and referred to them as her new best friends from the earlier election. So it, it just flip flops. It's it's. I get very hot under the collar about these things. I mean, all of that projection. So. How do you know when your project is drawing to a close in this kind of stuff? You talked about turning every rock over. Can you explain to us a little bit about that process of the project? Well, you go back and forth between the good images. And you start you start to sequence them and work with them, and um, you know it doesn't it, it doesn't end with the research. It ends with the photographs. But you know by then you pretty well know um, the framework. I mean, it could be all sequenced, and then it's like it's missing something. I don't know what, but I need to go back. Are we done? Yeah. yeah. Thanks very much. Thank you.